the last week of our vacation, uh, Alice and I, my wife Alice and I, and her mother Joan traveled to Denver to visit her brother. And uh, her brother John Wilson, he lives in, uh, he lives with another family, um, uh, Ray and Jane, and uh, are the, the, the the couple that he, he lives with, he rents their basement, I guess, their apartment in the basement. And, um, and John has uh, just had a brain surgery and a glioblastoma, big bad tumor removed. So we really wanted to visit him and give his mother a chance to visit him. And it was a beautiful visit. It was a gracious visit. Jane and Ray were so hospitable. It was really, really lovely. Um, they are, um, they are deeply committed Christians, and they are deeply committed Christians in a way that is profoundly different from the way that we are deeply committed Christians here. They worship and observe uh, their faith in, in really different ways. They, they belong to a church that does not have buildings. They only meet in people's homes. Um, they have a, an annual gathering. They call it their, their uh, convention. Um, it's, you know, people come with campers and they uh, camp in this big area and they get together once a year, but um, mainly they just meet in people's living rooms and they're very, very conservative. I remember once when, um, this is probably 25 years ago now, John was staying with us and um, John at that time was a minister in this church. And he warned us that this Episcopalian stuff that we were doing was a dangerous, uh, uh, you know, dangerous diversion from true Christianity. And I remember thinking, wow, uh, okay then. Um, obviously, I didn't agree with him, because here I am. Um, anyway, uh, th th what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show that there's this contrast Here's this wonderfully hospitable family, and their hospitality was unparalleled. They were so good to us, and we disagree so profoundly on what it means to be, or at least to worship as a Christian. I don't think we disagree on what it means to be a Christian, but we disagree on how that worship ought to be done. <clears throat> and so we're sitting there on the third day of our visit, and Ray and I are in the living room, and, and the conversation comes around to voting, and they're asking about how we vote, and we explain that, well, in Washington State, all the votes are mail-in ballots. And um, so, now you remember, what is it, about a year ago, we were talking about crossing the chasm. You know, how do you how do you communicate across big differences? This, and, and we talked about how important that is because it happens in families. It happens in relationships that we care about. And so here I am, having preached a dozen times on the importance of crossing the chasm with a Republican in his living room where he has fed us and welcomed us for three solid days and he tells me that the problem with mail-in ballots is that people will uh, harvest other people's ballots and change the vote and mail and vote for them. And all I could do, you know, was just I, I tried to stay calm and I thought, no, Ray, no. But out loud what I said was, well, Ray. There's no evidence of that actually happening. I know I've heard people say that. Um, and my experience is that it's a very convenient way to vote. You know, and I, and I tried to just sort of disarm the, the difference of agreement. We just sort of got quiet for a moment and then we changed the subject. <laughs> I think what I experienced there was that all of the work that we did to talk about how do we cross those chasms, how do we reach across those divides, the bridge only went halfway. And that's a problem. We need to be able to connect. Ray is a good man. 
with some really stupid political ideas. <laughs> oh, sorry, did I say that out loud? Do you see what I'm saying, right? He's a, but he's a good man, a really good man. They are caring for John. They've given John a place to be for as long as he needs to be there as he deals with his brain cancer. They're good, good people. They make really good food. I'm, I'm telling you, it was great. Um, so what do we do with this? How do we cross those chasms? This was just over something as trivial as, as, as you know, how voting is handled, right? What if it was something that, that really pulled at our heartstrings, okay? This week, um, I, uh, when I got back from my vacation, I had a bunch of email to catch up on, and, and one of the threads of mail was from our bishop. And our bishop had been attending something called the Lambeth Conference. Lambeth is a palace in um, England, and the Archbishop of Canterbury resides there, or at least presides there. And about once every decade, they call all of the archbishops and presiding bishops from all the Anglican churches around the world together to have a conference, the Lambeth Conference. And um, the last several decades, these conferences have been very controversial with lots of fighting about whether the Episcopal Church in the, in the United States in particular could be even allowed to remain as a part of the Anglican Communion. All of this over fights about human sexuality and whether uh, same-sex marriages can be blessed in the church and whether uh, LGBTQ people can fully participate as, as members or, or even as uh, ordained leaders in the church. And so this conference, um, uh, there was some question as to whether they would even call for a conference this decade because of how uh, acrimonious those differences have been around the world. And so the Archbishop of Canterbury called the conference and he said, what we're going to do is we're going to get together, we're gonna study the Bible together, we're gonna worship together and be in fellowship. And uh, except, all of you who have spouses who are of the same gender as yourself, uh, your spouses are not welcome. So immediately, um, they've like drawn a line in the sand. And ultimately, the, the bishops of the Episcopal Church decided to go anyway to be in relationship, even though uh, anyone whose spouse is of the same gender would not be welcome. So you can see this is a fraught situation. And what had been promised was an opportunity to come together and to get to know one another. And eight days before the conference, a letter was sent out by the archbishop declaring that there would be um, 10 position papers that would be voted on at this Lambeth conference. And these position papers would declare who we are and how we function as Anglicans in the world. And the papers included, one of the papers included such things as um, uh, acknowledging that the Anglican church around the world was formed as a byproduct of colonialism. And colonialism was evil and it, and it destroyed culture and it destroyed peoples. And, and so they're acknowledging that. Very much like some of the work that we've been doing in the Episcopal church around First Nations people and around uh, uh, issues of race and, and those sorts of things. And so it's this powerful sort of moving forward of acknowledging some of the sins of our history. And then in that very same paper, it said, oh, and by the way, we uh, declare that marriage is accepted in uh, to be between a man and a woman only. And they were told that they would be given an electronic device, and this electronic device had two buttons on it, and you could either vote for each of the ten papers, or calls, as they were called, and you could say yes, yes, 
this is consistent with who I am and as a follower of Christ, or I'm not ready yet to say that this is something that I could sign on to and agree to. So there was no no, there was just a yes or a yes, but not yet. And everybody was expected to vote on each of these 10 papers, and they were going to spend the entire two weeks of Lambeth debating and trying to come to agreement on this, which is sort of different from let's get together and study the Bible together and get to know each other. What happened was quite different from that, and um, it was quite powerful and I think quite beautiful. Um, the Holy Spirit works even when we get in the way. The Holy Spirit works. And what ended up happening was they did get together. And after the first two votes, they abandoned the electronic devices for voting. And they, um, I don't know what they did about the 10 papers, but they just started doing Bible study together and worshiping together and getting to know each other. And I read a, a, a really interesting article um, by Bishop Mark Eddington. Mark Eddington is a member of our church, he's, and he's the bishop of all of the Episcopal churches in Europe. There are Episcopal churches in Rome and in Germany and all over Europe, and he's their bishop. And he wrote this brilliant paper, and in this paper he said, what if... Jesus is calling us not to come together and convince each other of what is right, but to come together in the love of Christ. And that, that was a moment when my understanding of crossing the chasm was blown up. That was a moment when I realized that even though I felt like I had this profound understanding of what Christ is calling us to, I realized that I had stopped short. I have said, and I did say when we were talking about crossing the chasm, that the, the holy thing we are called to do is to come together and to listen to one another and to seek to see the Christ in one another and to take the risk of listening to what the other says so attentively and so openly, so vulnerably, that we might be changed by what we hear and trust that they are listening to us in that same respectful, vulnerable way. But how'd that turn out with Ray and me sitting in his living room? I was just brought up short. What do you mean mail-in ballots are corrupt? They're not corrupt. We don't have corruption in Washington. You know, it just didn't work. And I wanted to listen to him. But I realized that Ray and I are never going to agree about how voting ought to be done. But does that really matter? Is that really what Christ came to do is to give us better tools for agreeing about voting or about politics or about theology? Is that what Christ came to do? Jesus said, I have a fire to, and I owe that I, how I wish it were kindled already. I have a baptism to endure. Oh, that it, that it would be done. And then he goes on to say these outrageous things about conflict. Today we sang that beautiful meditation about peace, right? The peace of Christ. Well, where is the peace of Christ when you're sitting in a living room with someone like Ray and they say something that you just can't accept? How can you find peace in that moment? We were on our best behavior. Neither one of us called the other one names or, or we just sort of let it go, right? But does that really help? Is that the peace that Christ is calling us to? Is that the peace? Is the peace that Christ offers us to just get quiet when we disagree? Or is there something more? And what I heard, what I read in this humorous essay by Bishop Mark Eddington is that maybe, maybe the fire 
that Christ is calling us to is to burn away that belief that we all have to agree. Maybe the fire that Christ wants to bring is to get us to realize that our purpose here isn't to agree on the correct politics or to agree on the correct theology, but rather to see past all of that and to see that across from us is another beloved child of God. We may never agree about voting, but I guarantee you Ray is a beloved child of God. And I, ex I was blessed to experience that first before we sat in his living room and had an accidental political debate. I experienced that around their dinner table three times and, 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 and over breakfast. I experienced that as we broke bread together, as we enjoyed beautiful, wonderful food together and great conversation together. I experienced that as I watched their care, their tender care for Alice's brother in this difficult time in his life. These are God's beloved children. We don't need to agree about voting. And I actually think voting matters. I think it matters. You know, I think that my opinion about how voting ought to be done is important, and his opinion is important, and how we deal with these things are important. I'm not saying we should ignore them, but that's not what Christ came to convince us of or to lead us into. Christ came to show us that even more important than politics and even more important than our opinions closely held and even more important than our theology dearly held and our, our ideas about how worship should be done in a church like this or in a living room, in Jane and Ray's living room, that even more important than all of that is the love of God, that that is what Christ came to reveal to us. For me, this changes my understanding so profoundly of what we are here for and what we are called to do and how we are called to be together. I don't know how to move forward with this. But I trust that this message is, is, is from God. I trust that God is calling us into a relationship of love and respect. And maybe from within that relationship of love and respect, we can work out our differences or maybe not. Or maybe there will just always have to be differences and we'll have to learn how to be fellow children of God, even in the midst of those. So the conflict that Jesus talked about between mother-in-law and son and between mother and father and brother and sister and all of those horrible things that he said in that terrible, terrible, scary reading that we heard today. Isn't that what we live? Isn't that the world we live in? And we're being called to something profoundly deeper to actually trust in the love of God. Amen.